Hello and welcome to Talking Law from Women in the Law UK. I'm Sally Penny, a barrister at Kenworthy's Chambers in Manchester. I'm also the Joint Vice Chair of the Association of Women Barristers and the founder of Women in the Law and Business UK, an organisation which is passionate about supporting the next leaders in law and encouraging career progression through personal development. This month, we'll meet Rachel Roberts, who is the managing partner at Stowe Family Law in Leeds and Huddersfield. This episode of Talking Law, sponsored by Stowe Family Law. Rachel specialises in all aspects of family law, but has a particular expertise in dealing with the financial aspects of a marriage breakdown, as well as issues regarding children and the arrangements following a relationship breakdown. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Welcome to Talking Law. Thank you for having me on. Rachel, I want to start off by asking you about your own pathway into the law. Why did you choose law? Well, I probably had a slightly unconventional route as I first left school when I was 16 and went off to pursue my first uh, love, which was horse riding and three-day eventing. Um, I spent about three years doing that, um, but then at 19, decided to return and do my A-levels as I needed to find a career where I could earn some money. Um, (laughs) I picked law as an A-level just because it interested me and fell in love with learning it. So it then seemed the obvious choice to go on to um, and do at university. So I went to Northumbria to read law. Wow. Was there a particular person who encouraged you or any other lawyers in the family? Not really. I mean, I had a lot of family support, but there were no other lawyers in my family. Actually, I was the first of my generation to go to, first generation to go to university. Wow. Um, Dad was a businessman, mum was a stay-at-home mum, so I didn't really even know about the career paths available in law, really, until I got to university. Yes. Can I ask you, what preconception did you have then about the profession before you joined it? Well, I was educated at state school, and I think before I joined it, I fully expected at all times to be surrounded by white middle-class people who'd gone to through private education. Yeah. I've actually found since university that's not the case. That's not to say I don't think there are issues in diversity within the profession. Of course, there are. Yes. Um, Probably more so at the bar Mm. and probably more so in other areas of law. I think um, family law perhaps doesn't have quite the same issues as in other areas of law. Mm. Um, But there's probably still more diversity than I thought there would be. Yes. Is working as a family solicitor as you imagined it to be or or has uh, has it surprised you or fulfilled your dreams <laughs> <laughs> i think oh gosh it's hard to look back when you've been in a in a role for so long but yes. um i remember there being a really big shock moving from the academic side of things to actually practicing it and in the early days being quite surprised by how much time you spend holding clients hands when you're a family lawyer as opposed to you know practicing law per se I'd also say I think the thing that still surprises me, which is something you don't really talk about at all at university or when you're studying, is the need for business development and to to raise your profile. That's now a really big part of what I do on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, especially as managing partner. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Well, let's just explore that for a moment, if I may. I mean, what what led you to family law? Why did you choose it? I mean, what aspects attracted you and how's... How is it that you've progressed to become one of the few managing partners in the country and in the profession? I think, um, I think like most family lawyers, I you I like to help people. I think you most family lawyers are very um, sort of people people. You have to be to enjoy that really close personal contact with people. It's what's very difficult time in their life. Before that, it was about enjoying studying. It was that or crime, really. And I realised as I finished studying crime, as much as I'd loved it, I wasn't cut out to be sat in a cell at 3am with um, (laughs) being a duty solicitor. Um, So family was the obvious choice of being my other preferred subject at uh, uh, university. Uh, When I joined Stowe's or Graham Stowe Bates, and as it was then, it was to be a family lawyer. I knew that I would ultimately qualify as a family lawyer, so... I never really looked back from that. Yes. Would you be able to describe sort of a a typical day? And then I just wondered if you could explore a bit about what skills as a good family lawyer need to possess, do you think, in your opinion? My day is a lot more varied now than it used to be, I think, since I moved into the management role, which is one of the things I actually love about it. So I probably split my time maybe 50% doing actual day-to-day practicing of family law and 50% doing the other aspects of my role. So the business development, as I've mentioned, um, managing the junior members of my team, although I do have another three partners who assist with that as well, 
managing the office budget and trying to keep us all on target and obviously trying to bring in work to the office. Yes. In terms of the skills that a, a family lawyer needs to have, I think it's not enough to be a really good lawyer in family law. You can be a technically brilliant lawyer, but if you can't communicate with your clients, you're just not going to be successful as a family lawyer. So I think having a, a great de- degree of empathy is really important but also, which I think is quite hard to learn, the ability to detach yourself a little bit from somebody's situation. Yes. And to be able to st- take a step back. I think that probably gets easier over time because you have heard a lot of stories and there will all be similarities. And you learn that there's probably two sides. There's always two sides to every story and there's probably an element of truth from both sides. So you you, you learn to be a little bit more detached and to have a more critical view of what you're being told as you go along. Of course, of course. How does working with people at difficult times in their lives impact you? Because you're obviously dealing with giving advice to people Mm -hmm. at their most vulnerable, emotional and sensitive time. Uh, And I just wondered uh, how you avoid taking that emotional stress home with you, if you had any tips, because you've got twins, haven't you? I have. Yeah. Yeah, and just, you know, so you're not actually taking all that baggage home. I think that family time really helps, actually, because it's good to to be able to switch off and, and spend time with them. Personally, what works for me is, uh, is exercising is, is very key for me, keeping myself sane um, and meditation and yoga because I'm the latter two, because I'm not brilliant at switching off and, and yes. resting. Yes, you um, and me both. <laughs> so that gets me out of my head a little bit. But I think... Um, The profession is becoming increasingly aware of the impact of taking on people's stress on a day-to-day basis. And I'm lucky to work for a firm where we we have mental health champions. So there are people you can go and talk to that can signpost you to um, appropriate support if you need it. We've had a couple of people go through quite difficult things in cases this year. Mm. um, And we've paid for them to go for counselling to help them come to terms with, you know, the information that they've taken on. Because you do become very you know hung up on the outcome for your client it's hard not to you always want the best for your clients yes vicariously I suppose now I I want to ask you about uh, family law is often viewed from the profession within the profession as having a bit of a high churn rate would you you agree with that and why do you think it is if it is why that is it's not actually something I've particularly experienced. Um, actually, in my team at Leeds, the, the five longest standing members of the team have over 80 odd years worth of service between wow. us. I know. Um, and then there are three or four other members who have five plus years. But I think perhaps if there is generally a high level of churn and people leaving the profession, in part, there will be some of the inevitability that goes with the fact that we have a largely female profession or certainly predominantly female profession. Mm. So people leave to have children, perhaps for whatever reason, don't come back. Yes. And I think the other thing, it is a bit of a, a Marmite role. So what I love about the job is that close personal connection with your clients. But for other people, they feel that they can't cope with spending so much time hearing people complaining about things going wrong in their life so I you know I think it is a bit of a love it or hate it role. Yes uh, that might uh, sort of explain a bit of it. So you are the managing partner at Stowe Family Law. Now I've got in my mind Jessica Pearson from Suits. <laughs> if only uh, if I had her wardrobe. <laughs> I know I know <laughs> clearly the, the Americans uh, have got a, a different uh, view to us <laughs> and uh, she didn't do family law let's be fair but um, I, I just thought can you just um, for people who don't know what being a managing partner entail and um, why did you take this route, really? Well, I think it sort of found me. So I, I've been at Stowe's for 17 years now. Wow. I know. <laughs> I no high turnout rate there. Uh, no, quite. <laughs> and um, we were bought out by an equity house about almost three years ago now. And at that time, Julian Hawkhead, who I've worked with um, since I started, he, he was the managing partner of Leeds and, and was going up to be senior partner. Yeah. And um, I, I joke, and I've said this before at the Women in the Law events, that I found out I was managing partner when I read our Chambers and Partner submission, which said that I was managing partner. There had obviously been some discussions beforehand, but nothing formalised. Yes. Um, so I, I, I confess when I first got the role, I wasn't even sure whether I wanted it because mm. I didn't know whether it was the right thing for my family or if I could do it. But yes. it, it's actually been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my career Mm. and I'm really pleased I was given the opportunity. Absolutely. Would you say therefore when opportunities Uh, arise for younger listeners really take it? Absolutely Um, and I think it's that 
thing of being outside your comfort zone that you you have to get used to doing that. Um, and I did spend a lot of the first year very far out of my comfort zone. But mm. you kind of look back and realise two years later that you're doing stuff every day without thinking about it that felt a really big deal two years ago. Yes. So I, I think it's taught me a lot about how to progress as a person and that that's where your growth happens. Absolutely. And can I ask you, you know, the figures for um, law firms, uh, just 20% of law firms, partners are women in the UK. Why is the change still so slow, do you think? Uh, And are you hopeful things might even out? I think coming from a family law background, that doesn't feel as prevalent. For example, at Stowe's, when I last looked at the figures, and they they do change because we're expanding, but 70% of our managing partners were female. So we kind of turned the the stats on their heads. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And as I say, that's probably not uncommon in family law. I think it's much more difficult in a corporate law environment. And I think it's a a cultural thing. And I can only speak from the experience of my friends and and other, you know, peers Mm. that I know working in that environment. Yes. I think it takes time to change that kind of culture. If the um, managing partners that have been in those kind of partners that have been in those kind of roles have worked 10 12 hour days as a minimum it's a hard sell I guess for them to see the younger generation coming through and doing a lot less but I I don't know I think I hope that over time it will change because it's a shame to to lose lots of talent out of the industry because people feel it's not compatible with family life which I think is the main reason why we see so few women absolutely absolutely can I ask you then um what do you think we need to do to accelerate that change, do you think? Or do you think time will even it out? I mean, I think that the millennials who are coming through and are perhaps going to be the next layer of uh, partnership level have a very different outlook on life to perhaps what my generation and the generations that have gone before us and a much stronger live to, no, other way around, work to live mm-hmm. ethic, perhaps. So it, I think... If it's driven by that, then that may change the culture, which will then in turn make it easier for for women to have to feel that they have the can have the family life and still get to that level. Absolutely. Now there have been calls um, by various people for quotas for the number of women at partnership um, level. Just wonder what your thoughts might be. I mean, do you support it or? Uh, or as it's been reported, some female lawyers fear the clients will assume that women have only been promoted to bump up mm. the numbers. I just wonder if you could sympathise with I, that, if you yeah, have any I, views. I think that's a that's a worry and that's a, it potentially then a step backwards, isn't it, if, if the perception is that people have not got there through merit. I also think that having quotas, unless you do something to provide the right, right working environment is not really helpful because people are still going to feel that those roles are out of reach for them for yes. personal reasons. So, yeah. you know, unless the, the culture and the work, right working environment is there, you may not be able to fill the roles. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, can I ask you, earlier in the year, the Financial T- Times carried out an article asking, can you be a partner in a law firm and a mother? And we got loads of responses. I hadn't commented on that, by the way, but... Uh, on our Women in the Law UK LinkedIn page. And I just wondered, how difficult is it? You've got two young twins and you're married. And you're obviously proof that you can be uh, a partner in a law firm and a managing mm. partner. How difficult is is it? And I just wonder if you had any tips. Oh, um, there are times when it's challenging. I think I'm lucky because I work at a firm where I have a flexible working pattern. I start early every day, which means I can do the school run every day, sorry, every day, three days a week. Mm. Um, and I try and make those couple of hours after school all about the children, whether it's activities or doing the homework. But it does inevitably mean that I often end up logging back on a little bit later. Yes. But I, I look at my friends in other careers and they're all doing that as well. So I don't think it is just because I'm in a management role or just because I'm in a law firm, I think there's probably an expectation for a lot of, in a lot of areas of law where you, or sorry, a lot of areas of work where you are available perhaps more than you were ever expected to be. For me, it's, I think I, I minimise that by being efficient. I'm very sensible with my time. Yes. But I, you know, I, I just think, I think it once you get to a certain level in any career, 
you know, it's it's hard to do it within your allocated time. You always end up giving a bit more and that's what you're paid for. Yes, and you've been a brilliant ambassador for mm. women in the law yeah. in addition to that, yeah. Liz Rose. <laughs> Thank you. Um, which, is, which is great. And you've been very keen to develop a culture in your own firm, haven't mm. you, of agile working and smart yeah. working. And is that built on, on that ethos that you've yeah, been talking absolutely. about? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, I work at home at least one day a week normally, which makes... It saves me kind of an hour and a half of travelling and, and messing around, getting to and from the office. It's quite a relaxing day for me then, and it gives me a chance to catch up without being disturbed as, as I am in the office. I don't really mind if people want to work at home. If, if Some people work at home because they find it quieter and more peaceful and they can get more done. For some people that live further away, it gives them a day when they haven't got to battle up with the M1 or the M62. And from my point of view, whatever makes their life easier is is more important. I think a happy team is a more productive team. Yes. You know, and, and that's more important. Absolutely. And the millennials anyway want to work from home to brew beer. Mm. Well, uh, well. And <laughs> train for a triathlon. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, you know, uh, all, all um, inclusive. <laughs> um, we talked a bit about well-being earlier, which we're passionate about at Women in Law UK, and you mentioned um, meditation. And I just wondered, what do you do for your own well-being? What else do you do? I think exercise mainly, but I also love to cook. I find that really relaxing. So mm. I, I cook from scratch pretty much every day. Wow. Um, just because it's kind of pottering around the house and doing that is how I switch off. I'm not a great one for sitting down and watching the telly. Mm. I'm walking. If I if I'm sort of need a bit of peace and quiet, then I quite often get out for a walk outside, get some fresh air. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, I support that. What are you most proud of in your career? You've been in the job now for 17 years. You came to a bit late mm. first in your family to go to university. I just wonder if you can reflect for a moment on what you're most proud of um, in I, your career. I think probably how much I I feel personally I've I've progressed since I took on the managing partner role. So I think do it, doing that and giving that a go when it, it felt like a huge step for me. Mm. And I feel proud of, you know, the team's doing well. We've got a successful office. I'm told by the exec team that they're happy with how I'm performing. So um, <laughs> that that's probably my biggest achievement, I think. Brilliant. And what advice would you give to a young women and men, I suppose, who want to raise rise to the top? I think two things, really. The first is it's never too early to start building your network and to meet as many people as you can. It ever surprises me where I get work referred to me from, and it's not always the traditional links that you expect them to be from yes, yeah and the second I think would be to find a, find a mentor who will push you out of your comfort zone mm. I know when um, you and I first met Sally and you said to, <laughs> you, you said to me that you were going to help me raise my profile and I remember feeling vaguely terrified at did the I time. say that <laughs> you did <laughs> um, but with a few of your uh, less than gentle shoves um, <laughs> it's safe to say I've done some things in the last couple of year or so that I've you know pushed me out of my comfort zone have been really good for me fantastic because you're when you're a great speaker mm. you know you're, you're you're brilliant can i ask you there some fun questions if i may um and i love asking these who's your favorite fictional lawyer well not just jessica pearson for her wardrobe oh, yeah, i didn't know that I just, <laughs> no uh, i i probably i think alicia florick who's i don't know if you've ever watched oh, the good wife yes yes so it's a it's about a, the wife of a senator who comes back to law after having her children yes so i think for for two reasons one i you know, I, I appreciate the difficulty of, of managing your family and, and a career. But secondly, my, my parents divorced when I was about 21, just in my first year at university and um, having gone through a bit of a difficult financial time. And yes. mum hadn't worked for, you know, 25 years and she went back into the job market. And she wow. was, I mean, I will say that she wasn't somebody that particularly was driven for a career, but yes. she nevertheless, at you know, nearly 50, she had to start from scratch. And as a very bright, capable woman, she was kind of doing initially warehouse work and then admin work. Blimey. And she did. I mean, she she studied a law degree, actually, part-time as well, wow. but, but never got to use it, which yeah. was a shame. Mm. But I think it gave me the kind of determination of that I always wanted to be, no, I would be all right and could support myself. Yes. And I see that in Alicia Florick, and that's why I quite like her as a character. Um, I didn't ask you about role models before. Is your mother one of your role models then? I think so. I mean, she was she was a wonderful mother. She, yeah. I lost her a, a few years ago, oh, so I'm she's sorry. not around now. But yeah, she was a, a, a wonderful, a wonderful mother. I think I think she probably regretted that she'd let her career go quite so much when it became so much more difficult in life. But mm. yeah, yeah, no. 
Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Alicia Florek. Yes, great, great. No, I had that before, I don't think. Um, can I ask you about a book that has changed you? I find this really difficult because I'm a massive reader. Yeah, you uh, love the Women uh, Law Book Club, so I know you do. <laughs> At any opportunity, and I, I will read kind of anything from uh, autobiographies to um, to crime, to chick lit, to anything. But um, I've recently been reading a bit of Brené Brown's work. I don't know if you've heard no, of her at all. she's an American author. She's a Yeah, she's a shame researcher, actually, I think. But she's written a few books about sort of around vulnerability, really. And it, it's about how you we all think of vulnerability as almost being a negative thing. or yeah. um, But actually how being vulnerability is one of being vulnerable and allowing yourself to show up in life as your authentic self yes. is one of the bravest things you can do. Yeah. And I just I've really enjoyed reading her work and it's really resonated with me. Oh, brilliant. I need to I need to uh, read that. And then finally, have you got a quote? that you live your life by? There's a really lovely quote by Maya Angelou where she says, I apologise, I may have paraphrased this slightly, but it's something along the lines of, I have learned that people will forget what you said and what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Yeah. And I just think that's a really nice way to think about your interactions with people. And particularly now I'm in a management role because I realise that what I say or the way I behave towards somebody very junior can really impact their day. Yes. Um, and I would like them to all feel that I do that in a positive way rather than a negative way. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Oh, gosh, that's a good one. I wish I had thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> you can borrow it. <laughs> Rachel Roberts, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank I you. I really appreciate you coming on. Big thank you to Rachel Roberts, who's managing partner at Stowe Family Law in Leeds and Huddersfield. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Stowe Family Law. I'm Sally Penny. Thank you again for listening to Talking Law. We'd love to know what you think of the podcast, so please do leave us a rating or a review, as this also helps other people find us. And if you subscribe, you won't miss an episode. Until the next episode, please do check in, see what we're up to at womeninthelawuk.com. Bye for now.